Hello, everybody. I have the distinct pleasure of talking with someone today that I met last week in person for the first time, Dr. Ingrid Clayton, who has written this amazing book, Believing Me, Healing from Narcissistic Abuse and Complex Trauma. Check this book out. Dr. Clayton. Yes, thank you. (laughs) So I so much want to talk to you because of a conversation we had last week Mm -hmm. about fawning. Yeah. Um, The fourth F, I'm calling it. Yes. The fourth F. But what I want to do, I I never want to assume my audience knows everything Mm -hmm. about everything. Can you just fill us in a little bit about, you know, who you are, how you came to the understanding you have now, Mm -hmm. just a little bit about what you went through and how it took you a while to figure it out? (laughs) Just a little while. Just a little while. Uh, yes. Well, thank you so much for having me for this conversation. I'm excited about it. Me too. Uh, so, yes, Dr. Ingrid Clayton. I'm a clinical psychologist, and I've been in private practice forever. Uh, somewhere along the way, I became a trauma therapist even. I specialized in trauma, but I didn't have trauma, Mark. My trauma, I wouldn't even call it trauma, or I would call it trauma in like a colloquial, like everybody has trauma kind of sense, but I was deeply minimizing, um, comparing as though there's like this trauma measuring stick. And um, I didn't comprehend not only that I had experienced pervasive developmental trauma, which uh, we now call complex trauma. Complex trauma is relational trauma, ongoing trauma, developmental trauma. And um, I could not own my own experience with trauma, I now know for several reasons, despite my education, despite my training in trauma. um, For one, it was childhood trauma. And often in childhood trauma, you know, a kid is dependent on their caregivers. The caregivers are God. And we are very quick to internalize the problems in a family system as our own. So they couldn't be that bad because I needed them to survive. So that's a very common Um, survival skill in childhood for trauma survivors. But beyond that, I now know my trauma was narcissistic abuse by my stepfather, which was um, steeped in decades of gaslighting, where I was literally told, no, I'm not the problem, you're the problem, right? I was the scapegoat. And so even though I always knew that my family was dysfunctional, I knew that they were alcoholic, there was certain language that I could give. Um, I never understood or knew the language of narcissism, um, which would have lent, which would have given me all these other terms like gaslighting and emotional abuse and manipulation and things. Um, so what happened is I'm, I'm sort of well into my career and working with, with other trauma survivors and my stepdad uh, died. And when he died, I had a feeling of being more free and safe than I ever recall feeling. And you know, he was still married to my mom up until the day that he died. So he was in my life, but I'd also kept quite a bit of distance. So it wasn't like there was ongoing daily abuse. But what I felt was as though he had been living in my very cells. I left home at 17. I'm not 17 anymore, right? And um, I had carried this thing with, it was just It was a part of me, and um, I had internalized everything that I experienced with him to such a degree that I couldn't sort of see where I ended and where that began until he died. And it was maybe nine months later, I, you know, it was um, around the time of the Me Too movement and Harvey Weinstein, and and, um, I was driving along. I dropped my son off at preschool, and I'm listening to NPR, and I hear there's a tape. There's a Harvey Weinstein tape that's been, you know, revealed, but they weren't going to play it. So I pulled over not far from here, uh, heading towards Larchmont Boulevard, and I found the tape on my phone, and I listened. And my whole body, it was, I mean, it was a complete flashback to my childhood, Harvey's voice, the contempt, the way that he was the victim. Don't do this to me. I was like, this, this is my stepdad. And I could see Harvey 
as a narcissist. And so suddenly it was putting things in context in a way, honestly, all my training even on narcissism, it just didn't compute for some reason. It was like that, you know, my stepdad was just this asshole who walked around our house in his underwear. You know what I mean? It was like, I didn't, I couldn't see it clearly because it was my own story. And then after I heard that tape, I was driving along and it was like these lines of a poem started to drop into my consciousness and they felt so important. And like, if I didn't capture it right now, it, I, I won't remember and I wanted to. So I'd never done this before. I grabbed my phone again as I'm driving and I just started dictating the lines as they were coming. And I got to my office later and I read it back and I was like, this, this is important. I don't know what this is, um, but it's important. And shortly after that, more things started coming, but they weren't lines of a poem. It was like these fully intact essays, not only from my childhood, but, you know, dysfunctional relationships of my adulthood, all kinds of things. Um, it was like I was possessed with this need to articulate what had happened. And I, I still didn't know why. And I was in this process really of writing down all these stories for almost three years when finally enough material was on the page and so now it's I have enough distance from it right it's not in me it's sort of this thing that I can get a little um well distance from and and suddenly I could see it from a trauma therapist's perspective and not only could I see that it was narcissism and narcissistic abuse but that I have complex PTSD and I didn't know. I talk about this stuff every day in my practice and I didn't know. And so I thought if I had all this information and all of this terminology and trauma therapies and resources and I still didn't know how many people are walking around with similar experiences not knowing that what they experienced is trauma. And if it's trauma and you can use that language, suddenly you have access to all of these other things related to trauma, like the trauma responses, fight, flight, freeze, and fawn, which we're going to talk about today, trauma bonding, trauma reenactment, emotional flashbacks. Suddenly, I made sense to myself in a way that decades of striving and trying to figure it out and sitting on therapist couches and getting several degrees in psychology, like... I wasn't um, complacent. I wasn't just numb to the, I, I knew something was wrong. I it was sober for decades. I got clean and sober. I went to Al-Anon, like I did all the things, the spiritual retreats, like maybe if I pray harder and meditate long enough and go up to the mountaintop, that's gonna fix it. And nothing ever did. And so when you try that hard to overcome yourself and it still doesn't work, I must really be fucked up. I must really be fucked up because not only did I come from this place that I, that I knew was just, <clears throat> I knew was dysfunctional and that's never going to be me and very judgmental about it. I'm recreating the chaos in my own life. I can't find a healthy relationship to save my life. And I'm like, what what is wrong with me? I, I have this head full of information in some ways and it's just never moving down into my body, which again, the lens and language of trauma lets me know because they speak a different language, the head and the body. What I learned and, and the blueprint that sort of became my way of being in the world never touched into what I think I know about a thing or my opinions about it. My body was just orienting to safety and finding safety in the way that that it always had, which I now know was a, a chronic presentation of a trauma response. So I finished the book. The book is Believing Me. I, I am a clinical psychologist, but the book is really just my story because that was the other thing. I had all these terms at my disposal. I just didn't think they applied to me. So I felt like not only was it the way that the book came was just in story form, my own story, um, but I felt like maybe that's the way in for people to see themselves 
And of course, all the while I'm thinking, my story's so unique and people are really gonna say that's not really trauma, right? I'm like wrestling with all of this. And um, what's ended up happening is I'm just being flooded with messages saying, you're telling my story. And not only are you telling my story um, in the feelings and in the generalizable sort of quality of dysfunctional childhood experiences and, and what that did to us as adults, but even the specifics. I'm blown away at how many people share the specific stories um, of narcissistic abuse. It's like it's the same playbook just over and over and over and over. And so that's just been it's been amazing to feel like the book and whatever I'm doing on social media is giving a voice um, to people that similar to me, they didn't have a voice around these things, but it's also expanding my own that this this book is my healing. I'm not approaching it from, yes, I'm Dr. Ingrid Clayton. I'd like to speak to you today, right? It's like, no, it's like this is what I have to offer is how these things have and continue to live and breathe in me. The question I want to ask you is, is, is I guess it's more for the audience because yeah. a lot of people say trauma, but that's if I got hit. That's right. if I got beaten up. Yes. That's if this happened. And a lot of people may not have had that experience, but feel super fucked up. Yep. So can you talk just a little bit about that? Because in your case, I don't think that you were physically abused that much. In fact, that was the literal message that I received because I had, or at 16, uh, I had organized an intervention through the help of a school counselor who said, Ingrid, you know, the things that you're telling me that are going on at home, um, I'm a mandated reporter. I have to bring in social services. And so that's what we did at my little high school in Aspen, Colorado. Um, these two social workers showed up and I called my mom and said, Mom, I need you to come to the school and don't tell your husband about it. Um, and I could hear her tone like, what are you talking about? What's going on? And anyway, long story short is um, there was no physical abuse of me. I knew that my mom would have bruises, but I never saw him hit her. And there was no sexual abuse. There was no overt sexual abuse. But the language that I have now that I didn't have then was that my stepdad was grooming me to be his girlfriend. And this was the environment that I grew up in. And so it would move from giving me the silent treatment and icing me out. So I had my biological brother and my stepbrother. We lived in the same house. And my stepdad would come out in the morning, good morning, boys. How are you? Sleep well? You know, very sort of like, uh, you exist. You exist to me. I'm going to give you this attention. And I'd be sitting right there and there was just nothing for me, right? He would drive us to school. We lived way in the mountains. It was a 45-minute commute every day. And he'd be carrying on conversations with my brothers. It was like I didn't exist until I finally got out of the minivan and I would leave. And I viscerally remember the feeling I can feel it right now it's like the heat of his hatred was on my back as I walked to school and so we would move from the silent treatment but then it would flip suddenly I was in his good graces and he was interested in me but it always had this feeling like I knew it wasn't really appropriate attention. I knew that there was something there that didn't feel right, but he was never really obvious about it. Um, and two things I knew about his past. One is that he abducted his own son when he was four years old and he took him away to Florida for th almost three years and lived under an assumed name. So he had this like abduction past that he talked about really freely as though he was some hero like saving his son, saving him from what? <laughs> Nothing, in fact. Um, so I knew that he had this piece of his history, and I knew that he married his second wife because my mom was wife number three when she was very young. But it was sort of portrayed as like this young love. There was an age difference, but um, that was all I knew. But these details always felt important to me. And... Um, one day he shows up after a long time of the silent treatment and says, 
shows up in my bedroom one night uh, while my mom is out of town, of course, and my mom is never out of town, but her dad was dying. She was out of the way, essentially, and he shows up and says, hey, how'd you like to go to Las Vegas? And I'm like, what are you talking about? Well, (laughs) you're a singer. I mean, I imagine, you know, that you'd like to see real shows and real entertainers and how it's done. And I'm like, well, yeah, sure. One day I'd like to go to Las Vegas. And he said, pack a bag. Let's go this weekend. And I'm like, what? And he said, you can't tell the boys, you know? So this is happening so fast. And again, it's moving from where I don't exist, which is so painful, right? Because the other memory that I have of leaving that minivan is walking into school and wanting more than anything to feel like a normal kid and just go connect with my friends before school starts. But instead, I have to kind of sneak into the locker room downstairs where no one is so I can just bawl my eyes out because it's so painful. Not existing was so painful, right? So the silent treatment is abuse. (laughs) Like, it just, I didn't even have the language for the silent treatment. I'm like, why does he pretend like I don't exist? On one hand, it feels sort of innocuous. It's like, oh, he's not really paying attention to me. No, I literally didn't exist in my own home. It was brutal. And so moving from that into getting attention, it's almost like, I mean, again, I can feel these things in my body now. This was decades ago. It's like, I'm a real life boy, like Pinocchio coming to life. It feels, um, it does feel like moving from black and white to full color. I'm finally here. I exist. And you're giving me attention and you're saying, you think I'm a a good singer and and you want to champion that you know my creativity as an artist and you want to show me these things because you think i deserve it it's intoxicating so he goes from basically ignoring you for a long period of time yes. but years i assume no it was more like weeks or months weeks. it would flip and then suddenly he gives you this new attention yes when he's inviting you to vegas yes yes And the attention feels good, but the secrecy feels bad. And so I'm trying to kind of poke at it. And um, I'm like, well, you know, I don't, it doesn't really feel good to keep it a secret. He said, listen, um, I I, I was given two tickets. So that's, of course, a lie. I didn't know it then. I I was given two tickets. Your mom's not here. But if you don't want to go, I'll take John. So now he's pulling it away. And I'm like, well, no, I don't want you to take it away. Um, And he just said, I don't want them to be jealous. So I told them that I'm going out of town on business. And there are I made arrangements for them to stay elsewhere. And they think you're staying at your best friend's house this weekend. So he's already told them the lie. And it feels sort of like it's done. I don't want him to take it away because going back to where he literally despises me feels so terrible. So I'm like, okay, let's go. Let's go. And, you know, the longer details of Vegas and what what that was like um, are in the book. But the essence is this story that I carried with me forever, which is it felt like my stepdad was parading me around like a girlfriend. He dressed me up. We got to we got to get you some clothes. You got to look more sophisticated. You're underage, so you got to hold my hand everywhere we go. You know, they could I could get in trouble. They'll kick you out. <laughs> you know, this is pre-cell phones. I'm like um so but at the end of the day, you kind of go my stepdad took me to Vegas. What's the big deal? What's the big deal? And, you know, this all happened before social services. And I and I told the whole story and there really was no meaningful intervention. It was like, oh, you're a family who probably needs to work on communication skills and we're going to send you to some counseling. And the counseling was absurd and it all made things worse. So really what I learned is um, you got to suck it up. Uh, It's all on you. And maybe you were being a little dramatic. I never fully owned the things they said, which was you're a liar and you're selfish and you made it all up. But pieces of those things, based on the fact that it only made it worse, my truth was never validated. He went to the grave with 
his lies intact. And I think that was the other piece of why the stories came. And we'll talk about this with fawning, but I lived a life in this chronic fawning response. And when he died, there was a part of me that said, I will not let his story be the only story that's ever told. There was this fight response that was sort of coming back, which I think I had as a kid. I organized an intervention with social services. Like I had a voice. I wasn't so terrified of conflict, right? That's a healthy fight response. But that fight response got snuffed out. And so the body finds another way. And the other way is to sort of figure out how to go along and get along and believe these other narratives that we all hear about family in particular, like family's the most important thing and, you know, oh, she's your mom or whatever that is. And so you just become this sort of robotic figure that knows how to go along and get along in this really toxic system. And even if a part of me knew it was toxic, the other part of me just learned that this is, this is safety, this is reality. Um, and yeah, I, I even forget the original question, but. You have, have given me the most beautiful segue into okay. where I want to go oh, next. Oh, good. Okay, good, good. Because what I want to talk about is you, you're describing a, um, you're describing a family situation. And I, I've, we had this discussion, I think, maybe a month ago, and then probably last week again, is that part of what I'm trying to do is, is help people see that the, the, these patterns of abuse at different scales. Yeah. So yes, they happen romantically, but they happen in the family, they happen in churches, in corporations, in political parties, etc. And so the, the way you just described the dynamic in your family, mm -hmm. my thought was it's just like a cult. It's yes. exactly the same as a cult. Yes, yes. Tell me. I want to hear how it maps well, over. The there are these things that go on that if you had that full sense of yourself and you weren't completely traumatized, you might stand up and say, This shit's fucked up. Yeah. Stop. But that's not what you do. Mm -hmm. And the reason I wanted to talk to you so much about the the fourth F mm -hmm. is because Myself and many other people that have escaped, you know, these kinds of situations, whether they be cults or, you know, people that have escaped abusive relationships or marriages or whatever, one of the questions they get asked is, well, why didn't you just leave? Yep. You know, and why did you put up with it? And why did you kiss his ass? Yeah. Why did you praise him? You know, people say to me, for instance, well, why did you say good things about Keith Raniere? You know, did you did you believe them? And, 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 and I would feel stuck and go, well, yes and no. Yeah. But I sort of, I couldn't articulate it first. I can articulate more now. But yeah. at first, I, I couldn't articulate that it was too dangerous to create a problem. That's right. And so the, 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 the part of me that had the ability to judge these things well was completely suppressed. That's right. So the conversation we had last week was so amazing. And, and I'm not trying to recreate it, but I want to, I want to bring mm -hmm. it up again. Because mm -hmm. I didn't really understand until you know i got out of my cult mm -hmm. you know i understood fight or flight yeah understood that very well right freeze i sort of knew about mm -hmm. but then i heard about this fawning thing yeah and that really blew me away yeah because to me it began to explain like trauma bonding explained certain things mm -hmm. um betrayal blindness explained certain things but fawning was so interesting because it helped me make sense of what had been going on for me yes. for so long um, and why I had such difficulty standing up against certain things that 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 now I can say that was really fucked up, yep. but I couldn't. Yes. And it's not like, oh, you know, I had a choice to do it and to stand up or not stand up. Right. And I just, it wasn't even a choice. No, it wasn't even a choice. So what I'd love you to do, mm -hmm. because, you know, you're the clinician, not me, <laughs> is 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 sort of explain the four Fs, mm -hmm. and then I want to just get into that that fourth one. Just explain, you know, what they are and and how they're framed and and why they're so useful. Yeah. Okay. So the four Fs, and there are others beyond the four Fs, by the way. But uh, the the biggies that we talk about are the fight, flight, freeze, and fawn, and these are trauma responses. They are 
instincts. They are not conscious choices. And so if you look at sort of the animal kingdom, it's easy to see that if an animal is in the wild and it's like, you know, surveying the horizon and it senses danger, you don't want that animal to go up to the what, what we have the prefrontal cortex and, and really pause and think about it and ponder like, hmm, right there, instincts. I either got to get out of here. I got to be ready to fight. I'm going to play dead, right? Um, and so we've talked about those three for a long time. And there's a lot of literature to support, you know, what's happening physiologically um, that in fact, our conscious rational brain does literally go offline all systems that are not in service of survival including digestion and things they just stop and you go into this survival mode so fawning was coined by pete walker and he's a psychotherapist he coined the term about 10 years ago now in like 2013 and he was working with relational trauma, right? So as a species, human beings, we are relational. We are one of the few species that our children can't really live independently until 18 and beyond, right? Like a fourth of their lives. So um, we are by nature relational beings. And so complex trauma is a relational trauma. It's not like I'm going to be eaten, I'm going to be beaten. It's... um, I don't get to exist as a whole person. I'm not allowed to have a voice. I'm bad and I'm wrong. Like it it has so many different shades um, of internal experience. And so Pete Walker was working with this population and he was like, there is something here that he saw over and over. And he also is a survivor. So it was also, you know, run through his personal experience. There is something here that is not being talked about and you know as he tells it i think he was watching like a national geographic show or something and he saw like a wolf and uh, an outlier wolf and then there was a pack of others and he thought there was about to be a fight or something and instead he saw this wolf like i need to i need to befriend this this pack of wolves and he thought oh that's so interesting and at the same time Uh, He was walking across his living room and he stubbed his toe on the couch and he apologized to the couch. (laughs) Oh, so sorry, you know, and it was almost like this combination of things that he was like this, this thing where I sort of cease to exist. I prioritize you over me. I abandon myself in service of other, even if the other is a couch in this case but in the case of the wolf it was like um needing to kind of mirror and merge in order to fit in and survive and so he i think you know trying to stay consistent with the f's he he thought of fawning and um what else do i want to say about this because there's a lot of different ways so i can go by the way yeah i, I, I did not i did not know this thing about the wolves Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah. know that this is what, what, where he understood it from. Yes, where he understood it from. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there are other researched trauma responses like tend and befriend, for instance. But if you look at that, it's really talking more about uh, the way that we sort of connect with community in order to stay safe. Fawning is different because it's not a community that's banding together. Your community is actually the perpetrator in fawning. The the community is not safe. And it creates a very different internal experience. And so when I heard the term, like I could really honestly weep if I really let myself think about it. Because I'm not kidding when I, I can't tell you how many therapist couches I sat on. Wanting to understand this part in me that what happened when i went from black and white to full vibrant color there was this part of me that felt like i'm going to do whatever i have to do to stay in his good graces and the language that i used at the time what it felt like in my body even though i was a virgin (laughs) 
I knew that I, part of the maybe power that I had was that he was sexualizing me, my stepdad. And I said, maybe to my friends, certainly to myself, I feel like he's pimping me out for his pleasure and that I am prostituting myself. And so, you know, when you put fawning, even in the context of a trauma bond, one thing that I think goes missing that people don't talk about enough, if I was in this sort of perpetual trauma bond, it wasn't just that I was being abused, which I was. There were times in that experience that I felt powerful. It feels powerful. It feels intoxicating when, in this case, my stepdad, the narcissist, kind of finally shines his light on me because I'm that special and I get in touch with the things that allow me to mirror and merge his desires and help me feel that special. There's sort of nothing else like it. There's nothing else like it. Is it, is it intoxicating because it's compared to the danger? Yes, I think that's a piece of it, right? So if, whenever I talk about trauma bonding and I go, it's, it really does feel like this, it's like when you hit the jackpot, right? It's, it feels incredible when you've hit the jackpot. But part of it is in contrast. It's the contrast to what you're getting the rest of the time that makes the highs feel that high. Um, I don't think that's the whole picture though, um, it is just the contrast. Because even as I talk about it now, there's something that lights up in me that felt, um, it felt important. And now that I can see fawning through the lens of trauma, I definitely know that it was about survival, but that's not how it felt. Um, it felt like I was almost like a sorcerer or like playing with fire, but in a way that there were times I felt like I could actually manage it and then it would always flip. It would always flip. I couldn't sort of hold it long enough. And there's also just some magical thinking there too about like, I have more control, I have more agency. I think that's a piece of the intoxication too. It's like, um, but what ended up happening is my sense of agency and power um, became fused. And this is what often happens in fawning. I found safety, and I put safety in sort of air quotes, right? Because it was as safe as I could be in a very unsafe situation. And yet, my body found safety in being exploited. So what did I seek out? time and time again, long after I left home, relationships that exploited me so that I could feel that feeling, that internal feeling like, here's my sense of safety. Here's my sense of power. Oh, you're exploiting me. I must have something to offer. It was like the only way that I could get in touch with the fact that I had something to offer was in this dynamic. That's what in, in those circumstances, you felt like you had value. Yes, yeah. that, that was my value. Mm -hmm. And my value was in large part reduced to my sexuality. And again, this all happened when I didn't even know what my sexuality was. But once I inhabited myself as a woman, it felt like it just was gasoline on a fire. And so how many bosses and colleagues and largely older men, inappropriate men, married men, I would find myself in this dynamic over and over and over where I'm like, why are they pursuing me? I, I really, this was the question I asked on many therapist couches. Do I have a sandwich board that says I'm looking for a corrective experience, right? It's like, why, 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 why? Now I know that it's a combination of these things. I was in a chronic fawning response, right? Who do you need me to be? Who? Oh, oh, you might be attracted to me. I better be attractive to you. 
and it would start to grow. But I always felt like, but I'm never going to be with that person, right? So I felt like their particulars, their age, their marriage, whatever the thing was, was the boundary. And yet they would try to cross it every single time. And I would be shocked every single time. I was like, what's happening here? What's happening here? Um, So fawning led for me to the way that I reenacted my trauma because safety is found in being exploited or with unavailable partners, right? It was sort of different threads that that ignited that thing in me um, and led to this perpetual experience of being in trauma bonds. Some that I never left from my family of origin and the new ones that I created, right? So this is the stew that I was cooked in, that I was swimming in. It's it's the only thing I knew. And even though I didn't want it, to go to that question of like, well, why didn't you just leave? Leave what? Leave myself? Like I'm bringing myself to therapy. I'm looking at things that I can do to better myself. I'm, I'm meditating. I'm, I'm, I'm doing all of the prescriptive things. But it literally wasn't until I could see myself as a trauma survivor, as a relational trauma survivor. And listen, complex PTSD, it's not in the DSM, the Diagnostic Manual in the US, right? We are still debating these things. Fawning, So here's what I was saying to you when I got here today, that I had these sort of new revelations related to fawning, how they're playing out in my life now. Um, Not only is CPTSD CPTSD not in our DSM, it's in the World Health Organization's um, uh, ICD-11, their manual. So we kind of have the language like, oh, this is a thing, but the powers that be have not really established it as a thing. And when I was looking at fawning recently, I was trying to write something for psychology today, and I kept being unable to write it. I couldn't find my voice around it. And I realized only yesterday after months of going, why aren't I writing this thing? I literally called Pete Walker, who coined the term. I'm reaching out to Dr. Stephen Porges of polyvagal theory, really wanting to know how does polyvagal theory see the fawning response? Like, Pete, how did you, why did you coin a new term? Why didn't it resonate with these other terms? Like, um, basically, I'm looking to anything out there to validate it as this real thing because I was starting to get a little pushback from people like well Ingrid is it really a trauma response and how is it a trauma response like tell me what's physiologically going on and suddenly I was like oh no oh maybe it's not a thing maybe and so I see only just 30 seconds ago that I was doing the thing again I was abandoning myself and what is decades of personal experience that not only helped me define, but finally start to heal this thing and seeing it in my own clients, right? But I was going, but someone else's voice matters more than mine. Safety is found outside of me. What if somebody gets mad at what I'm, what if they disagree? And suddenly I'm so discombobulated that I can't even sit down to write this thing. So I was fawning as I was trying to write a piece on fawning. But again, I didn't even know that. It just felt like an anxiety was rising in me. And I was like getting farther and farther away from what felt true, looking for the answer out here. And I couldn't find it. And then I'd get more frustrated. And then it made me believe even more that my personal experience was wrong because I couldn't see it. I couldn't see it validated in this way that I felt like some people were wanting it to be validated. And uh, I, when I finally saw that, I could go, oh, my voice matters. And this is the antidote to fawning. My voice matters. My experience matters, right? So Pete Walker would say that 
fawning and fight are on opposite ends of the same spectrum. So when I say that the fight got really snuffed out of me, it makes sense that I went to fawning. Okay, well, I guess I just have to be this in order to exist in this family. But coming out of it has meant I can't keep privileging my mom's wounds over mine. I can't keep acting as though it's okay that my stepdad did what he did and not own the severe consequences that it's had in my life. Because the truth is, there's the stories of what happened to me as a kid, and they're fucked up. They are. But they pale in comparison to the symptoms that I've been living with for decades. The way, so there's traumatic events. The events are in childhood, but that's not trauma. Ten people can experience the same event. Some of them might just be like, Whew, it was a Tuesday. Their body does not get overwhelmed. Their nervous system processes it, moves through, whatever. Other people experience the same event. It overwhelms their nervous system. It gets stuck in time. It creates a meaning and a belief system that becomes so fixed and it never resolves. It feels like capital T truth. This is unsafe. This thing is unsafe. Oh, here's more evidence. The brain starts collecting more and more evidence. Oh, here it's happening again. It's happening again. Now I'm recreating it, right? Because I'm in this trauma reenactment. So there's traumatic events and then there's trauma. Trauma is what happens inside of us in the face of a traumatic event, which also just blows this notion of like a trauma measuring stick out of the water. It just doesn't matter. You know what I wished as a kid? That I had bruises. I wished it was more obvious. There was a time when my brother, my younger brother, uh, he told some crazy lie to the teachers at school. My parents make me sleep outside in the freezing cold Colorado winter, in the empty hot tub, and the, the um, cover of the hot tub is my only blanket. And you know what I think now? I go, that was genius. He was trying to come up with a story that made sense for what he was feeling more than the story that we were living. Our parents were business owners in town, right? We had a lovely house. I always got new school clothes. All of these things driving us to school every morning. Um, none of that like normal or whatever external stuff never fit with what was happening behind closed doors and how it was eroding, it was infecting, it was like a parasite living in each of us in this different way and the toll that that took. So that's the trauma because it took root in me. You know, a big feature of complex trauma is it distorts your sense of self. Not only was I not a good student in high school because I was too busy surviving what was happening at home, I was sort of told like, you're, you're, not, you're not smart. Like I wasn't, no one was championing my uh, growth and being curious, like what are you interested in and what are you learning at school today? I really just thought I was dumb. My nickname was Dingy Ingy. Everyone just called me Ding, right? And so I just kind of took that on like, yeah, you know, I have smart friends and I'm glad that they're so smart, but that's not me. I can sing, you know, that's my thing. And so this is the self gaslighting that we start to do when you're told over and over, you're selfish, you're the problem. You're not very smart. You're not putting the pieces together. There's a part of me that believed it. And I was self gaslighting. Maybe it wasn't that bad. Like these are terms of, so maybe it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that really big of a deal. And it keeps these things intact. Oh, I have so many questions. Just to go back to like the way of describing fawning. Yeah. Because I was thinking about, you know, I had a stepfather for a few years when I was very young who was, who was really abusive and torturous. Mm. And what I did, I don't remember so well, my mom tells me, what I did was I just fought back all the time. Mm-hmm. And it got worse. Yep. And it got worse. Yeah. And it got very torturous mm. and this guy was just uh, he was a mean motherfucker to me and somewhere along the line i i wonder if because i started being very afraid of of 
violence and of and of violent men. And I would find that sometimes with if it felt very dangerous, I would be super nice. Yes. And I would be like trying to get them to like me. And, and so I was thinking about fawning because part of it feels like if you if there's physical danger, like I want the person to like me because I'm not a fighter. Right. And I will get pummeled. Yep. So I got to get them to like me. I got to be smart, funny, something. Yes. And then, so there's the the part of like, I don't want to get hurt. But then there's the part of sometimes I want to be liked. Yes. So maybe they're not dangerous physically. Yeah. But I want to be liked. And so I will try and carry favor. And then as you were talking, I was thinking, but that's also a kind of danger. Like it feels like this danger of not being liked, of being thrust out of the tribe. So... Just to just to recap, so I, I really understand and really yeah. get it. Yeah, fawning is this is a way to feel safe. Yeah, whether it's physical, emotional, whatever. Yeah, to feel safe in the face of something that feels dangerous. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all trauma responses are about finding safety, about finding safety in the body, and it's just the particular mechanism that it that it takes and. Um, what we know really about all the trauma responses. Okay, so trauma responses aren't a bad thing. Like we're very grateful for the for the trauma response. It helps us literally survive, okay? And yes, initially we can happen upon particular responses in the face of danger. But what happens for some and what happened for me, the trauma the trauma response starts to become personality and you really genuinely think that it is and so there are aspects of fawning altruism and being of service and caretaking like these aren't bad things right they're they're very useful lovely things in certain contexts but when you feel like you can only do those things in order to be liked to be in relationship right it's this it becomes this chronic codependency and you and I talked about this a little bit that I never saw myself in codependency. And I think there's a couple reasons for that. One is that it comes out of the chemical dependency world. And I identified more on the addict side, right? And addicts are like Psh, codependence, right? So I, it was so stigmatized, I couldn't really own it if I was going to own the sort of addict part of me. Um, but I also, I was just like, I don't, you know, it felt like it was like almost talked about like a choice of like come on just get some self-esteem you know and it just was like well like I just couldn't see myself in it but fawning actually it's like the heartbeat of codependency and when I realized these things aren't a choice these aren't conscious things that I'm doing they were reflexive instincts you know, I never said, oh, I'd like to sort of uh, prostitute myself in service of my stepdads, you know, whatever. Uh, no one would choose that. <laughs> no one would choose that. But it's what worked. And the body is clocking that. Oh, that works. That, look how effective it is over here. Look how effective it is. And to your point, it's still dangerous in the sense that it requires self-abandonment. That's the biggest difference. So if I'm being of service because it's a choice, because I'm holding on to myself and I feel like I want to be of service, I want to give in this way, I I mean, I think that's amazing. I hope there are parts of me that will always be oriented like that. But let's be honest, I in part became a psychologist out of my fawning response. I exist for how I serve you, right? It's like, this is my value. This is my, how can I be helpful to you? The way that I can merge and mirror even my hypervigilance, my childhood sort of hypervigilance of like monitoring micro movements and sort of intuitively knowing what they mean. It's all led to what has, you know, been a lovely career in some ways and I'm grateful for it. And... There's a reason that I wrote a memoir because I need more me in my own life. Again, the antidote to fawning is like, I cannot just be here in service of the other, whoever the other is now. I need there to be more me and 
all of me in my life, not just the shinier, you know, whatever, uh, more whatever aspects of myself, um, which is also why when I got on Instagram and I found this way to sort of be very silly or irreverent and there was this part of me that was like, Ingrid, you can't do that. You can't do that as a psychologist. You're going to you're going to tank your career. And this other part of me, this part of me that is genuinely healing from fawning is like, I'm going to be me and I'm going to be all of me in one place. I'm going to be a clinician. I'm going to be a survivor. I'm going to be someone who has some answers and is still trying to figure out a lot of others. And I'm going to do it with a sense of humor that at least makes me laugh a lot of the time. And it may not be for everyone, but it's been so helpful for me. And that is the new measuring stick stick not how will, will it just be helpful for other and, and I struggled with that in the writing because there was a part of me that was like oh, I think this could be so helpful for other people but I was like but is it going to be helpful for me mm. and I have to keep coming back to that and and I have to be very conscious about that like what are my intentions and how is this in service of like capital s self and that's not selfish. And and I was always told that it was. And so it's also flipping that idea that it's not selfish. Right. In fact, it's selfish to to pretend that, oh, I'm interested in you. And yes, I completely understand. That is selfish because it's a lie. And again, there's no shame in this. It's not shaming. Um, it's the other, I think, gift of understanding trauma is this is just this is just how we're wired. My body did exactly what it was designed to do to survive the circumstance that it was in. We learn through experience, not just an intellectual knowing. We learn through experience. So my body went out and did exactly what it learned. And these are the kind of people that you know how to hang out with. And these are the environments and all the rest of it. And I did continually what I did to survive my childhood. And now I go, oh, so there's no shame. And I go, it doesn't have to be this way. It really doesn't. This is the thing I wanted to to bring up again is um, I had such a bad reaction to fawning when, right. I, when I first heard it. And, and I think the reason is because I felt like, oh, it sounds so weak and so pathetic. And, you know, I really did not like the term until I really understood that, like, it's because of that mechanism mm -hmm. that I probably survived a whole bunch of stuff. That's right. So, like, thank you. Yeah. Um, so that it really helped reframe that and, and why this is such an obsession. There was something else I was thinking as you were talking about hypervigilance. Mm -hmm. I suddenly realized... I wonder sometimes if people think maybe that they're hyper empathic. Oh, they when do. They're actually, just hyper all the time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They th this language of empath and highly sensitive. I think it's also been sort of co-opted in a very spiritual way, and you know that's more palatable than going. I'm a trauma survivor, yeah. right? Yeah. I I walked on eggshells, and so I had to learn how to survey the lay of the land and know what was coming before it was coming to save my ass, right? Like, um, so, but I do see the tides turning at people going, oh, that's maybe what that is, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, because no, a lot of people walk around saying I'm a hyper empath and I'm like, I just can't say it about myself. No, me neither. I was always I mean, like, mm. Do I think that I'm empathic? I think so. Yeah. But like, I would never call myself some, you know, hyper whatever, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, this other thing, as you were talking about the the goodies, let me just make sure. As you were talking about the goodies that you got mm. from fawning, yeah. at first I was like, I'm not really relating, but I understand intellectually the structure of what you're saying. And then I, as you were talking, I sort of tapped in and I was like, oh shit, no, I do know exactly what this is like. So throughout my life, this thing of being of service, yeah, putting somebody else first, yeah gave me a really good feeling but now i take it further yeah also thinking of myself as a piece of shit mm -hmm. and valueless also gave me a very good feeling 
Like I'm, I'm shit. Yes. Like I'm nothing. Like I would feel really weirdly comforted by that thought and the feeling, you know, of, of mm. I'm nothing. Let me do everything for you. I mean, there's so many times in my right. life when, you know, in, I would help other people make money, but I, I wasn't, I wasn't worthy of that. Right. You know, or somebody needed something and I would like do everything for them, uh, but I wouldn't, I, I couldn't do that for me. Right. And so the retraining has been so interesting. And I think in part of the, the retraining, it's not even retraining, part of the need that I'm feeling to, to establish a m- more profound and solid sense of self that's not based on, you know, just a trauma response. Yeah, yeah. I find myself pushing up against these thoughts. And so this is the thing I really wanted to, to get to, and I, I definitely want to spend time in, in, in fawning, but we had breakfast last, last week. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember if you said this or if I asked you the question, but I actually, no, I spoke to Dr. Ramani after this, mm-hmm. and I asked her this question. Mm-hmm. And I said, do you think it's possible? Mm-hmm. I was talking to Dr. Clayton. Do you think it's possible that all this altruism that I've been doing is an is a long term, decades long fawning response, and without a beat, she said yes. I'm like <laughs> shit, I know. shit. I know because we were talking about it. Yeah. So I have had this thing. I have to make the world better. That's right. And you know, yes, I saw bad shit in South Africa. I knew it was wrong. Thank goodness I saw a lot a lot of those things because I had a, a way to measure this that's not good, what's good. Mm, mm-hmm. But what would happen is I would, I'm, I've been on this mission to the detriment of myself. Yes. It's like, well, I'm going to go make this movie and like, I don't need much money for it. I'm just going to go make it. And it's been years making stuff that producing enormous amounts of value. Yeah. But like, uh, you know, not making much or making nothing sometimes. Right. And... I've been trying to figure out, okay, so if I didn't need to, quote unquote, save the world, yeah, would I want to make things better? Mm. And so that's been on my mind a lot in the last few weeks. And I found that I, th- I still would want things to be better, mm-hmm. but this compulsion of yes. I have to, I have to, I have to. And it's very highlighted right now because I get, you know, since The Vow, season one and season two, I get a lot of messages from people. Mm-hmm. And they have a cult that needs to get taken down or oh. they have an abusive relationship that needs to be exposed or something. Yeah. And at first I was like, what can I do? How can I do? And then eventually I was like, I, I, I don't have the life force yeah. to, to do this. And that's when I really started to think like I feel bad mm-hmm. that I'm not jumping at every single need somebody has. And then I started mm-hmm. to feel oh, that's fucked up. Like where am right. I in this? Oh, yes, yes, you exactly. Know? Mm-hmm. So now I'm trying to navigate this like well what if i did things entirely on my own terms mm-hmm. i'm not talking about being an asshole and you know yeah, i don't care about it. entirely yeah. on my own terms where if i do this thing it's because i feel fulfilled in it i feel full in it that's right as opposed to there's something fundamentally wrong with me and i'm going to reenact that thing again and again and again because maybe at the end of this i'll finally feel like i have value that's right so um two things one is when you talk about the bad feeling that comes when we don't help or you know it can present like guilt or maybe i'm being selfish that's when i go oh we're moving in the right direction and that part of our work is to tolerate those bad feelings and recognize that they are just feelings they are not statements of us having lack or deficit in that way but the other thing that i actually think that you're talking about which we spoke a little bit about um is no one's like a pure fawn response or right like i'm an equal opportunity drama responder you know a little little of this little of that uh depending on the situation but the two biggies that i have identified with are the fawning and flight and so flight isn't just run from the situation it's staying in perpetual motion it's perfectionism it's achievement it's sort of out running this internal thing that says i'm not good enough oh my gosh maybe if i do something big enough in the world and i know for me any t- and it's and it feels like a compulsion 100 mm-hmm. percent. anytime i feel that in me it doesn't matter what i've attached it to it's like 
Maybe it was graduate school. Oh, it can't just be a master's. It's got to be a PhD. Now I'm licensed. Maybe it's private practice. Maybe it's writing. Oh, it's got to be about having a family. Whatever the thing was that I attached to when I get this thing, then it's going to be okay. It satiates me for maybe half a second, if that. Because, and this is interesting, we think that the flight response is about the impact. Maybe it's an altruistic impact, saving the world. It's not actually the essence of the trauma response. The essence is in the striving. And that's why it can jump from this to that to this. Oh, maybe it's my cult. It's your cult. It's, you know, whatever. It's in the striving for the thing that feels like I'm finally going to get somewhere, but we don't Mm. until we stop and slow down and get curious about what's happening in our bodies. Even just saying that, I take a spontaneous deep breath. (sighs) Probably the first one I've taken in this whole conversation. Just being curious about what's happening in here brings me deeper into myself, which is actually the thing that I've always wanted. The thing, yeah. The thing we've always been looking for Yes, in all the wrong places. That's right. Yeah. Right. I'm also having this moment of like, huh. I know. <laughs> so I never, I never saw, I never saw productivity and compulsive productivity as part of flight yeah and so different people might say it differently that does come out of walker's work too but again it just that framework has made so much sense to me yeah um and because i'm not a wild animal like about to be attacked i'm living in my life where it feels like there is this outrunning this thing that i need to sort of overcome or work out in some way that's the compulsion and that it's been very directed in this external sort of validation or yeah some idea of what I think is going to happen um and it's I'm of two minds about it um listen I'm grateful that I ended up working with other people and the gifts that that has given me it's beyond measure Um, I'm grateful for some of the things that I've, that I have striven for, that I've achieved and the information that I've gained or whatever. Um, And I'm sad that it came out of this thing that was trying to resolve, that couldn't be resolved. Like, um, I wish I was a little more, my whole full self was a little more in the driver's seat as I did some of those things than I have been. But I'm working on that now and I feel the... I feel the difference. I mean, it's huge. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it looks on the outside like I'm doing some of the same things, the way it feels differently in my body is such a gift. So a lot of what we're doing, it's weird because I'm about to say words that I, that we were taught in the cult as well, but that wasn't what, what we were doing. Yeah. A lot of what, the journey feels like is we're constantly misidentifying the truest version of ourself mm. with everything else. Yeah. And that's why we're never happy mm-hmm. because it never lasts and it never works. Yeah. And the only thing that really seems to work for me is those moments when I'm very still mm. and it feels like I'm building or fortifying a relationship with myself. Yes. That feels truly wonderful. But I notice that because it's not a well-worn pattern yet, mm-hmm. there's all these objections to oh, that full state. Of course. Yeah. And I would say for me personally, um, it doesn't always feel so wonderful. In fact, it often feels like shit. It feels like terror, right? Because if I'm not doing the thing that always kept me safe, I'm just feeling the triggers. I'm feeling the prickliness of my actual world and I'm not doing the things that always helped me manage it. So it feels like I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know who I am. I don't know how to be in relationship. Um, I'm being mean. What's wrong with me? 
and 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 quite frankly when you write a memoir about childhood trauma some people are going to have some feelings about it so now like i'm even getting the a little bit of the pushback of like no you're still a liar and you're the problem and all that kind of stuff and 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 i go maybe it's true right like what we have to confront is not for the faint of heart like i think doing the real trauma work and no matter how you frame it coming into your true whole self is some of the bravest hardest most profound work because it isn't that spiritual bypass i'm on the mountaintop kind of thing it's like i'm in the cellar <laughs> i mean it's dark in here i'm fucking cold and freezing and i don't know how to get out and i'm terrified um that's some of the stuff that we have to face and i say without question it is worth it it is worth it because that is the thing that is allowing me to find a new sense of safety in my body now and it's not safety in air quotes it's actual <sighs> safety and this idea like trauma healing or however you want to language it is not about becoming your best self right and that's not a very good marketing pitch it's like <laughs> people want that i wanted that my whole life help me find my best self how am i gonna do it you know i was the most compliant give me the answer i will do it perfectly client and whatever and the truth is my best self includes all of these pieces that it really includes my shame. The part of me that doesn't know, the part of me that's fumbling, the part of me that feels selfish. It's making room for all of these things that I've been trying to outrun my whole life. Yeah. It's a bit of a buzzkill when you language no, no, it that no. way. No, no, no. It's so it's so important <laughs> because I I did a I did an episode recently about spiritual bypassing and it's such a concern because I've been an expert at it. Oh yeah, me too. I've I've you know made movies that do it basically, <laughs> um, but I find I think the the experience that 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 I've come out of you know this the coming out of the cult thing. There's certain things that I feel allergic to, like inauthenticity. Yeah, I feel allergic to it now. And also I noticed, and I think this is a good thing, when I see myself fawning, it doesn't feel good anymore. Right. It feels like shit. It feels like shit. And, I'm think and I thought to myself, maybe that's good. Maybe that's sort of a, a quote unquote rewiring that's yes. going on where I'm like, I don't feel good because I feel like I'm now abandoning myself. And, and I find that, you know, um, Dr. Romney was talking about this with me the other day about, you know, uh, one's resistance to narcissism. Mm. You know, if you're highly resistant to narcissism, you put up with a lot of stuff because you're so busy, you know, trying to navigate your way through it and fawning around their behavior. Mm. And so I find that if I'm around somebody who's very, very grandiose, mm -hmm. my tendency is to, you know, fawn 1000%. Right. Because like I, I'm trying to like make sure everything's okay. Because yes. on some level I must feel a danger. But what's happening now is I'm starting to feel like a, a distaste for it. Yes. Which I I'm happy about. It's brilliant. really happy. It's incredible. I mean, from an IFS internal family systems model, they might say it's like the fawning even is sort of what they would call a manager. That's been. I mean, it it has been an effective manager, but the managers are tired. Mm. They get tired and you see they start to fall away and then you get access to what they would call your exiles these more wounded parts that have like been tucked away for so long i'm never going to experience so that again the exiles are the hidden parts that, that haven't yes, had deep, much deep exposure wounds yes uh, um and so there really is this internal reorganization happening and i think yeah some of that um like even disgust for fawning uh, is a piece of that. I I want to go back to something else you said because I mm. found it interesting. I'm trying to remember the language that you used when you were saying, I didn't really see myself in this aspect of fawning. Yeah, because you described like a good feeling with it. 
Yes. Oh, yes. yes and yes. I was like, what? Yeah. And then, and, but then as I examined and, and introspected, I was like, oh, shit. No, I, I know exactly what that feels like. Well, it made me wonder. And of course, I only have um, the viewer's view of your experience through what I've seen in the, in the docuseries. But my, my uh, take on it was that you were sort of, you know, the golden child of that organization in a way. And that must be a pretty good feeling. At first it was. Um, see, they got me when I was getting a lot of accolades. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they got me on my, on my, you know, save the world thing. Yes. They got me on that. Yes. That was the thing they got me on. And they got me on, you know, we have the way that you haven't been able to find. Right. Ugh. And we think you might be smart enough. Oh, my gosh. To get it. Even hearing this ignites my response. I go, this is it. Yeah, this is it. That's, that's the thing. My whole life, you know, I, have, I was a straight-A student for a while. Mm -hmm. um, I studied, like, you know, when I went to boarding school, because I was in boarding school for a lot of my life, mm -hmm. you know, we had this, like, you know, voluntary study, semi-voluntary and compulsory. Mm -hmm. I aced everything mm -hmm. so I could do whatever I wanted. Yeah. Because I was like obsessed mm -hmm. with being good at everything and obsessed with being smart. Yeah. And so, you know, when you start to get around people that are telling you, you know, we love your mission, we think we can help you with that mission and we think that you can get this. And, you know, you're being blown away by a lot of interesting because, look, not every single thing in that in that uh, educational model was complete bullshit. Of course. There's there's really all, this stuff. is narcissistic abuse, hands down. Absolutely. There's always good stuff in it, right? Yeah, yeah. I was legitimately wanting to be a singer. I think I had legitimate talent. And my stepdad was speaking some truth around that, yeah. right? It was like, this wasn't all smoke. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, but you know, it's funny. I wanted to just, on the topic, but I wanted to just refer to something. So some, there's some footage some of the footage is in the vow. And when I was um, working with the FBI, uh, shortly before trial, um, I found th this footage that had been shot behind the scenes of me taking photographs of Ranieri in his library. Mm -hmm. the, that, that library, you know, where, all the, where he had oh. all the stuff stored. Ooh. And I watched it with with the FBI, watched everything, mm -hmm. um, and I was dying mm -hmm. because he was being so insulting. Mm -hmm. And I was like laughing and smiling, and I was like, I was, I, I was so embarrassed because I wasn't like, fuck you, motherfucker. Right. I'll fucking deck you right now. That's right. You piece of shit. Yep. I was laughing. Yeah. He insulted my wife. You know, this weird, you know, weird roundabout way. And I didn't laugh at that, but I didn't say, watch it. Right. I didn't say that. Yeah. And I saw, so what I saw in this footage that was eventually used in the trial mm. was just constant stoic fawning, I would call it. Mm. It wasn't like I was groveling. It was yeah. like the stoic fawning. Right. You know, where I yes. wasn't calling him out on things that were, that were not good. Right. He was saying things that were shit. Yes. About me. You know, about my wife, about mm -hmm. other people, about women in general, you know? Right. And everything in me now, the person I am now, yes. if somebody started saying that shit to me, I'd say, you know what? Shut the fuck up. I know. Do not fucking do that around me. That's right. I, I have such a hard line now, but maybe it's, you know, all the shit I've been through, but like, I, I just don't tolerate it anymore. That's right. But it was difficult to see that. I bet that it was. I mean, you know, there's somewhere towards the end of my book where I say, if anyone turned to me today and they said, Ingrid, I don't believe you. Mm. You're a liar. You made the whole thing up. <laughs> I would react like you're reacting now. Like, yeah. shut the fuck up. What yeah. are you talking about? I have zero respect for you. Yeah. I will never let your version of this thing trump my own. I know who I am, right? But that is not where I lived for no. most of my life. Yeah. First of all, we know historically trauma survivors are often shamed about their response no matter what it is. And 
For a long time, that was related to their freeze response. Why didn't you just leave? Well, they didn't just leave because perhaps they were not in their body at all, that that is a function of dissociation. And you don't have the ability to get up. You're just, you're leaving your body in order to survive the event. That's why you didn't leave. And dissociation isn't just in the moment of a sexual assault, for instance. It's a state that people often find themselves living in. And so my mom was a good example of this. And I talk about this in the book that one time as an adult, I'm visiting her and I'm three feet away from her in her kitchen. I'm saying, mom, mom, mom. And she finally turns to me and said, Ingrid, my life is so painful. I just have to disappear sometimes. And then the moment was gone and she kind of snapped back into more of a, a fawning presentation, actually like, okay, we're just going to get on with the day and oh, Randy's coming in and how would you like your eggs kind of a thing. Um, so, so that's the freeze response. But I think fawning in some ways can even get more of a bad rap because there is the appearance of some level of participation. Like here you are functioning in the cult and you have, you know, this particular role in your scene in, in this way and um it's like what were you what were you thinking you know and i read something recently um related to fawning and polyvagal theory that sort of made sense to me and helped me understand this a little bit more um and polyvagal theory is just a way to understand what's happening in the nervous system in the face of trauma and so if the fight and the flight response are like your foot on the gas pedal going to run, get out of there, fight back. Freeze is like your foot is on the brake. Fawning is one foot on each pedal. And I was like, that's it. Because there is some level of I'm participating here. I'm showing up in a particular way. But it's with this self-abandonment, which you could also refer to as some level of dissociation. I'm dissociating from this truer, deeper sense of self. Um, so I think on the face of it, if you don't have this experience of fawning, you can be like, well, what were you thinking? Like you were clearly participating in there. Um, yeah, my nervous system was doing exactly what it needed to do to survive that situation. Yes. And for me, when mm -hmm. I look back, I wasn't there a lot of that time. Like I was also dissociated. Right, of course. Because when I when I look at some of the stuff sometimes, you know, and, and, and the vow is a very, it's a very, um, it's a deeply vulnerable thing to just think, you know, crack your chest open and show the entire oh world what's gosh, going on. It's yes, not, it is. Not, not, not a lot of fun. No. But there are certain parts of the, the vow, I'm just like, I can't watch this again. I can't yeah, look at this again. Yeah. Um, there was a moment that I wanted to talk to you about because it's not, you, you never see it in the vow, but in, in, April 2017, mm -hmm. I am now talking to a number of, of women that have been abused, and I now know what's going on. Not mm -hmm. everything, but I now know what's going on. And I also know these are litigious, dangerous motherfuckers. That's right. And I'm in the middle of producing an intensive in Los Angeles, in Venice. And Nancy Salzman is in town. Mm -hmm. And there's a few, you know, celebs and whatever that are in the intensive. And... I know something dark is going on. I don't know everything, mm -hmm. but I'm but I go to the intensive for a few days, and I'm supposed to go and do these different, you know, psychological, you know, things with everybody. Yeah, that we all did. And first of all, I go off book. I am mm -hmm. I am not doing any of the techniques that that are in the book. I'm like I'm off book completely. I'm all about this helping is a these conscious choice. Conscious or? choice. Okay. I, I'm trying to help these people find as best as I can not being a psychologist, find their true self. Yeah, yeah. That's all I'm trying to mm -hmm. do. But for years before, whenever like, you know, Nancy Salzman would be coming up to the thing, the whole thing they had us do was that you had to edify the, the, the person of higher rank. Mm -hmm. And edify mean talk about them, talk about their attributes, why you like them so much, why you respect them so much, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. It's this weird like praise thing you have to do. Mm -hmm. And I never liked it very much even though I truly believe that it's important to edify people you respect, but I never mm -hmm. liked it because I, I felt forced to yeah, do it, it all the mandate. time. It was yeah. horrible. Mm -hmm. So every time Nancy Salzman would come into the room, I would, you know, I would do this edification, and, which, was, which was basically fawning. 
Yeah. But I was so dissociated as well. And I had so many things going on that I sort of just shut myself off and I just, I'm just going to do my job. That's right. I'm just going to perform. But on this particular intensive, the day she arrived, it was my job as the highest ranking person in the room to introduce Nancy Mm -hmm. Solomon. And now I knew shit was really dark. Mm. And it was the first time I was consciously aware Mm. during the process of edification of like fawning. Like suddenly I was no longer dissociated. Right. I was like fully fucking awake knowing that this was not good. Right. But I had to pretend everything was okay. Wow. Because at the same time as I'm in there, I'm talking to law enforcement. Oh my word. So it's this weird thing and I have to show up and now... It's conscious fawning. Yes. And so I, I noticed that there is this there is this part of fawning that, that you're not all there. No, I mean, I, hearing you say that, I can recall my moment of conscious fawning after decades of living in this sort of, this is just how what you do to kind of get along. I'm visiting my mom and it's after I've been writing the book for several years because this was through the pandemic. I didn't see her for a long time. It's the first time going back to her house and I'm looking around and I'm seeing all of my stepdad's things as though he's still there. In It's like a shrine to him in some way. And it's sitting in me in this awful place that it's 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 deeply triggering in a way that I had disconnected from for so long. Now I'm owning the truth of the impact. And yet I'm like, are we going to have lasagna for dinner? I'm not saying you're putting me in a bedroom that is a shrine to the man who abused me. I'm saying, what should we do with Henry, my son, right? Like, and it was the beginning really of the end because I saw that my managers were tired and I could not do this thing like that anymore. And I felt my fight response coming back. I wasn't directing it towards her that still felt too terrifying but i could feel it and then in safer moments i'd turn to my husband and i'd be like can you believe you know i would give him the real deal so it was this real just sort of like you're walking in between worlds and oftentimes in therapy i'll call moments like this the hallway it's like the door behind you has closed the one in front of you hasn't fully opened yet and you're in this period of transition where maybe one foot there one foot there and it's so disorienting and confusing but a really important part of the transition so true out yeah that's exactly what it feels like yeah between two worlds yeah the consciousness is just dropping in your body but it's not fully safe yet and you're you're in the environment and so you are, it's which becomes autopilot. Like we say, these trauma responses sort of become personality. You're doing what you've always done. You've done it 8 million times, just like I was in relationship with my mom in the way that I had always been. But there was like a, this has to change. But I wasn't ready for it to change on that trip. And so I made a conscious choice. I'm just going to get through this just like I've gotten through every other time. But I left there knowing that it was never going to be the same that I couldn't do it anymore. That's really profound. The thing that's so great about our conversation is, and I hope people get this out of this, mm. is that all of these things that look like complicity yes. are, are, it's trauma. It's trauma. It's trying to deal with trauma. That's right. And even, you know, I look at even, you know, there, there's, there's various you know, cults that I'm looking at today, and there are people that are that are um, enabling the leader. Mm-hmm. And now finally, I go like, oh, I get, I get what's going on. Mm-hmm. I get how trapped they feel. That's right. You know, I get that they feel like they don't have a way out, and they have their values and the leader are so married together that they can't even conceive of pulling away. It's too dangerous. It's not even on their mind. No. I mean, that's the thing. The The longer that I've been in this awareness, the harder it is for me to believe that I didn't know my whole life. Because it's so obvious now. I go, how did I? He, mm. My stepdad is a classic narcissist. Like, it is the writing is on the wall. And yet, even when I sent the book to Dr. Romney for her endorsement, 
There was a part of me that thought she was going to write back and go, oh, Ingrid, that's so cute. You thought he was a narcissist? Because I'm still going, maybe it's me. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm misreading this thing. Maybe I'm making it all up. Up until the wire where I've written the whole thing and I send it to the expert on narcissism and at least half of me is going, she's going to laugh. She gave you a glowing review. And instead she says it's one of the most compelling, accurate portrayals of this type of abuse. And it just, I mean... She gave me the biggest gift in that, and I will say, the part of me that was willing to write my story and offer it up to the expert on narcissistic abuse and say, will you please consider endorsing it? I have to give that part some right. credit too because she was terrified and she did it anyway. Right. Um, but the other piece I wanted to talk about with this idea of being complicit and, you know, conscious. And of course, it's so easy to see it from the outside. Like anyone who's read my book, they're not questioning whether or not that was traumatic. And I really thought people are, that was the feedback. The, at least half of the feedback I was going to get was like, you know, come on, Ingrid. Like that's, that's nothing. You know, to my knowledge, not one person is sort of questioning um, this thing about um, how aware were we at the time and the lengths that we were willing to go to to essentially betray ourselves i do think that's deeply confusing to people and i think particularly for some reason when you're talking about sex and so here you are coming from what is now being referred to as the sex cult right and how did all of these women sort you know they were in long-term relationships with keith and all of this and i go you know what Um, Because here's what I found out about my stepdad only through the writing process, because I started doing research and talking to anyone who would listen. And I called his ex-wives and old best friends, and I just looked under every rock that that possibly could hold some answers for me, because I was trying to validate the truth. Like, what did actually happen? And what I learned was two really important things. My stepdad had a history of preying on young girls. His second wife was 15. When he married her, he tricked her into going to Mexico, just like he tricked me into going to Las Vegas. He married her when he was down there um, without her prior consent. And he had been grooming her for months prior to that in the same exact ways. Hearing her story, it was like tracing paper over mine. And I realized my stepdad never wanted to rape me. He wanted me to want him. He wanted me to fall in love with him. He wanted me to want him back. That was the manipulation. So if a fawner is looking to stay safe by mirroring and merging, I wholeheartedly understand how his second wife ended up marrying him and having a child with him. I thank whatever powers that be that even though I was fawning and I was sort of like, how can I make this good phase last a little bit longer, that there was this other part of me that was like, I will never give him what he ultimately wants. Um, But I can see completely how that happens, where if that's the thing that you need to do to stay safe, You absolutely surrender your body. It's not just an internal abandonment in terms of, you know, emotional safety. You're you're handing yourself over. Um, And I think so many women in particular, since I've been talking about the fawning response, I can't tell you how many people are reaching out and they're going, why have I never heard about this before? This explains so much. And even to think about the seeds of my story in some way coming out of Harvey Weinstein's, it's like the history of Hollywood even and the producers and their black books and who were the women that were going to be willing to do X, Y, and Z. That's It's all fawning. It's all fawning and being preyed upon as fawners and finding sa- some modicum of safety in that really unsafe and sexuality holds a lot of power. And yeah. so guess what? You feel that much safer 
by using that. And yet so many women have felt so deeply ashamed. My own history included some of the stories I share in the book of the positions that I was in and the things that I would do. These are not of my character. Right. I'm so happy you said that because I have people say to me sometimes about, you know, the, the women that were involved with Ranieri. Like, how could they, did they have bad taste? I mean, right. he's a schlub, he's ugly. And I would say, that's not why they had sex with him. That's right. But I, I didn't have the language to defend them adequately. Yeah. But I don't believe a single one of these women was really attracted to him. No. They were scared. They were scared. They were dissociated. And they wanted the promise of whatever he was promising them. So it's all on this hook, you know? And coupled with all the other things we know about this type of abuse, isolating you from any other sane voices and all of the rest of it. And um, it's just, it's the it's the stew that, that you're living in. And it's that, you know, the heat gets turned up over time. And so I can see that one day he's taking me to Vegas. But if I had been living in that environment much longer, if I didn't sort of say, oof, I'm up and out of here because that was sort of my salvation. Um, I can see that it would have happened to me like it happened to so many before me. Yeah. And I can I can see how it how it happens all the time, but I think the piece that makes me so heartbroken is that so many people are just holding the shame of it as though they're all to blame. It's this very victim blaming thing and um it's just not, it's not the whole story. And, and, and in a way I go, fawning is genius. It is so genius because it is partially like I'm engaging with the system that I am in and I'm denying enough of myself in order to continue functioning. Like, first of all, who could consciously really do that to that extent that the body just instinctually does? I go, I have such reverence for it. I think it's amazing. And I don't see it in the same vein that I did for myself for so long, which is I'm just so broken. I am evil. What is wrong with me? These are the things that I felt about myself. Mm. And I don't now. That's amazing. I have gotten so much out of this conversation, let me tell you. Oh. I have a lot to think about. Um, was there anything, anything else you wanted to share before we closed out? I'm just feeling gratitude. I'm feeling gratitude for this conversation and the sort of uh, amazing thing that you and I are coming from such different worlds in so many ways. And yet the minute that I learned of your story and then I've had the privilege to get, get to connect with you a little bit, the connective tissue just sort of blows my mind. And um, what you're doing to further this conversation and help educate folks like flight response or not, I know that there's like a there's a lot of heart in what you're doing and why you're doing it. And I feel personally gifted by it. Um, you know, it's amazing for me even to get to watch something like The Vow because there are so many similarities. It's validating of me and my childhood. It's validating of survivors. And um, this might be too far afield, but Marsha Linehan, who's the founder of Dialectical Behavioral Therapy, half of her model related to borderline personality disorder and its treatment, which in large part is a relational trauma, complex trauma. It's not all of borderline personality, but it's a big piece of it, um, is what she calls this biosocial model. So there's the biological sort of inborn sensitivity. And then there's the social piece, which is the invalidating environment. And so half of the model that she created is about finding true validation for what you went through and what it did to you. And I think sharing our stories does that. It's so powerful. And so you're sharing your story in all the ways that you are uh, has meant so much to me. And I'm so grateful oh, to get to continue you. the conversation. Thank you. And look, I, I've listened to a, a bunch of podcasts with you. Oh. And it's moved me so much. And oh. like, to this understanding of fawning, which is which is pretty new to me still i really hope i believe it will i really hope that people will it will help unburden them yes. from a lot of 
the self-hatred yes. and the shame that they felt. Yes. Because the way you put it, it's like this really natural, important, if not essential thing. That's right. That our body does. That is my greatest hope, is to unburden myself from those things and help others do the same. And it's why I'm sort of running all of these concepts through my own nervous system, through my own story to kind of offer it up and go, so here's what happened and here's what I did as a result. And so that people can go, that's what I do. That's what I did. Maybe the trauma response or this idea of trauma or even narcissism um, does apply to me in my life. And listen, I wouldn't wish that on anyone, but if that is their truth, I want people to feel in alignment with who they actually are and what actually happened so that they can finally get to the place that I wanted to get my entire life and just couldn't get a foothold, which is authentic, authentic self. And you're, you're doing that, so thank you. Well said. The book by the amazing Dr. Ingrid Clayton is Believing Me. Get it, mm. read it. Mm. Believing Me, Healing from Narcissistic Abuse and Complex Trauma. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much. <laughs>